I'm a big believer in the idea that someone can come into your life for a very short period of time and have a massive influence. I truly believe that. In my case, it was uh, a great American grappler called Dean Lister. Dean Lister was invited by Matt Serra to come to the Hensel Gracie Academy. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe Dean was a brown butt at the time. I'm pretty sure Matt was a brown butt at the time too. Now, Dean was known mostly in those days for his Achilles lock. Later on, he would become a heel hook specialist, but in those days, it was mostly an Achilles lock. And he came to the academy, he rolled with some people, and he did. Uh, he was doing Achilles locks and getting some success. He was doing something which was unusual. And so I talked with him just briefly after class, and I said, you know, that's interesting what you're doing with these Achilles locks, because I don't really do that at all. It's not something I do. And he said one sentence which completely changed my outlook. He said, why would you ignore 50% of the human body? One sentence. Why would you ignore 50% of the human body? And I looked and I was like, I don't know. Why, why would you? It makes no sense. And we never talked again. And then he went back to California. He went on to become two, two-time ADCC champion, mostly with leg locks. Um, but what Dean gave me was not technique. Didn't show me a single technique. But he gave me a point of view. And if you give a man a point of view, you can change him. Now I know you're going to think about swimming. So if you kick, I have to help you fast. And uh, my sensei, Hensel Gracie, was an extremely uh, liberal-minded professor of Jiu-Jitsu. He would let us do whatever we wanted. Okay, he wasn't one of those guys who said, no, no one in my academy is studying leg locks. He was never like that. He, was, he would allow his students to go in any direction they wanted, provided they could prove it was effective. So I started studying leg locks, and that's where I'm going to come to the second question. Why did leg locks have such a bad reputation? You would always hear people refer to leg locks in the following way. The first criticism, they were too dangerous. Okay, If you allowed people to do leg locks, everyone would be injured in a week and jiu-jitsu would be impossible. So that was the first criticism you would always hear. The second great criticism is they didn't work. Okay, um, You might be able to tap out a white belt with a heel hook, but if you're world championship level, you're never going to tap anybody. Then you would hear other arguments that they were positionally unsound that if you were in top position and you went for a leg lock, you would lose position and that was a disaster. Okay, That's a criticism with no merit because it, that same criticism applies to guillotines, arm bars, etc. You can be mounted on someone, go for an arm lock and lose position and end up on bottom. But no one criticizes arm bars. Um, so as I went through the reasons why people criticized leg locking, none of them really made sense. So I started asking myself, well, Often the reasons people give, as opposed to what the real reasons are, are very different. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought the real reason people don't like leg locks runs much deeper than that. Let's understand jiu-jitsu for what it is. Jiu-Jitsu is a systems-based approach to fighting. Jiu-Jitsu is a system based around four distinct steps. You can add steps, you can subtract steps, but the, the rendition I'm going to give you now is probably, probably the most widely known. You're going to see always that step number one is take your opponent to the ground. You put them on the ground, dynamic explosive movement is massively curtailed. It takes away the single riskiest element of fighting, which is quick, dynamic movement that can generate kinetic energy. Mm. So step number one of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is get it to the ground. It's inherently safer. Less things can go catastrophically wrong on the ground than in the standing position. Step number two, get past his dangerous legs. Okay, if I end up inside your legs, if you're a skilled Jiu-Jitsu player, you can arm lock me, you can leg lock me, you can strangle me. Even if you were an untrained fighter, you could upkick me. Right. Many a man has been knocked out by an upkick. So step number two is get past those dangerous legs. Step number three of Jiu-Jitsu is to work your way through a hierarchy of pins where the pins are graded in value according to your ability to strike with effect on the ground. Step number four, submissions. 
So we've just described Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a four-step system. It's beautiful, it's elegant, and it's deadly effective. And now the question that needs to be asked, where do leg locks fit into that system? Leg locks don't fit comfortably into that system. Leg locks fit into the system in only one way. When the system has failed. When the system's not working and you can't take your opponent down, you can't pass his guard, you can't maintain a dominant position, and you can't get the regular submissions to work. Fuck it, try a leg lock. Leg locks were seen for generations as a signal of failure. When you couldn't get the system to work, you had to resort to leg locks. It meant you were a bad jiu-jitsu player. You couldn't impose the fundamental system of jiu-jitsu, and so you chickened out and you went to leg locks. That's why they were despised. That was the real reason why for generations, leg locks were dismissed. What I did is I tried to find an avenue where they could come in. And the results were surprising. The first thing is, our four-step rendition of Jiu-Jitsu looked at Jiu-Jitsu from top position, where we took our opponent down to the ground and we were on top of them. But my study of Jiu-Jitsu didn't start from top position, it started from bottom position. If you look at my students in competition, you will notice that around 80% of their entries into leg locks come from bottom position or with their opponent behind them. In other words, from what are supposedly inferior positions. So for me, it was never a question of losing position when I went for leg locks, because I was already underneath my opponent. I started underneath. How can I end up on bottom by going for a leg? I'm already on bottom. But things became more interesting when I got further into the leg lock game and I started to realize that as you add leg locks into the game, you change the very nature of the sport. If you look at Jiu-Jitsu as it's ordinarily practiced, it's a single direction game. If someone is in front of me and I'm standing over them, Jiu-Jitsu is all about movement from the legs towards the head. I'm supposed to pass their guard, work my way up to chest-to-chest -to -chest contact, and get my head next to their head, either in front of them or behind them, either mounted or rear-mounted. So Jiu-Jitsu always goes in one direction. If you ever get stopped or you lose position, you just start the process over again. It's a monodirectional sport. It always goes from the legs to the head. Once you start adding leg locks into the game, Jiu-Jitsu becomes a two-directional sport where you can go from the head down to the legs. You can go in both directions. So if I'm passing someone's guard and I simply can't do it, I can fall back and go back into the legs. If I'm side control on someone and they start to recompose their guard, I can fall back into the legs. I'm going from their upper body down to their lower body. Traditional Jiu-Jitsu always goes from the lower body directionally up to the upper body. So that you end up head to head with your opponent. But once you start adding leg locks, Jiu-Jitsu for the first time becomes a two-directional sport instead of a one-directional sport. And you can play your opponent's reactions between the threat of lower body and upper body in ways that opens up submissions so much more easily than the traditional game. <laughs>